Rangatirama, e hoama, ladies and gentlemen, ki ora tato katoa, nga mihi nui ki a koutou i tēne po. A very warm welcome indeed to the Museum of New Zealand, to Papa Tongarewa. My name is Claudia Orange and I'm leader of research now at Te Papa. And tonight is one of the many evenings we have had in our Forum for the Future series, where we present and discuss subjects and matters of concern that affect New Zealand and the world. Last year, we had two evenings in which a number of speakers discussed the increasing gap between rich and poor in New Zealand. A number of them have contributed to a book which is now available called Inequality, a New Zealand Crisis, published by Bridget Williams Book, and ready for you to buy outside at a special price. <laughs> With us are two of those writers, um, Professor Robert Wade and Professor Jonathan Boston, and Jonathan will introduce Professor Wade this evening. A very warm welcome to both of you. I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge that this event is co-sponsored by the J.R. McKenzie Trust and Bridget Williams Books, and also by the Friends of Te Papa, who are tonight the hosts for the museum itself. A very big thank you to each of you who have made this possible. This evening is also being videoed and should be available within a day or so on the Te Papa website and also on the Bridget Williams Books site where there is additional information. It might, in fact, be easier to find it um, in a less cluttered situation on the Bridget Williams site. <laughs> and so it gives me very much pleasure to hand over now to Professor Boston to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Tanakoto, <clears throat> Tanakoto, Tanakoto Katoa. Thank you, Dame Claudia. It's a great pleasure, indeed honour, to be here tonight and to participate in this important event. And it's uh, wonderful to have a full house. Today is significant for a number of reasons, not least because this morning the Ministry of Social Development published <coughs> its latest report on household incomes in New Zealand, Trends in Indicators of Inequality and Hardship, 1982 uh, to 2012, produced by Brian Perry. In releasing this report, the Minister of Social Development made a number of important remarks, uh, including acknowledging that, and I quote, child poverty remains a serious issue. We're not here to talk about poverty tonight. We're here to talk about inequality. The issues are different, although related. But it is significant, in my view, that the government is taking issues of both poverty and inequality more seriously. In that regard, it was significant in my view that last week the Minister of Finance, Bill English, gave a speech to the Trans-Tasman Business Circle. And in that speech, for the first time, at least as far as I'm aware, he explicitly endorsed the goal of reducing income and wealth inequalities and enhancing equality of opportunity. Hitherto, as far as I'm aware, uh, Mr. English has generally dismissed the proposition that inequality matters. But in this speech, there is a definite change, certainly of rhetoric, in the government's approach. No longer is inequality seen as irrelevant. On the contrary, reducing inequality is endorsed as a legitimate government policy objective. And he justifies some of the government's recent policy initiatives, particularly in housing, education, and welfare, at least partly on the grounds that they will reduce inequalities. How significant that change in rhetoric proves to be, we will, we will have to wait and, and find out. But I take some comfort from the fact that there does seem to be at least a modest change in the way these issues are being discussed. Tonight, we have the great honor of having a thorough look at some of the issues and implications associated with inequality from Professor Robert Wade. Robert Wade is a distinguished New Zealand political economist. Uh, he is currently Professor of Political Economy and Development at the Development Studies Institute at the London School of Economics, where he's been for many years. He has worked on a wide range of policy issues 
over the course of his academic career and for a number of different institutions, including the World Bank. He is the author of numerous important books and articles and has received a number of very important international prizes for his work. And not least, <laughs> last but not least, he is a contributor, as Claudia mentioned, to this uh, important book, uh, Inequality, a New Zealand Crisis. Tonight his lecture is entitled Inequality and the West, Capitalism at a Tipping Point. May we welcome Robert Wade tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. It's very nice to be back in Wellington. Um, as the son of a New Zealand diplomat, um, I spent much of my schooling overseas, but I did go to Haitatai Primary School and to Wellington College and to Victoria University. So um, it's, uh, it's for me a return to a city which um, I think of all the cities that I know, um, and that's many, um, most, not all, but most of the changes that have happened since the 1960s have been improvements rather than deteriorations. I love walking around the center of Wellington uh, these days and, uh, and just feeling jubilant that uh, the whole thing has been developed not with the sort of green eyeshade accountants mentality but with a real sense of um, making an urban space that people appreciate and want to come to. So um, these are the people that I wish to thank, especially Bridget Williams, who's sitting right down here. Um, but I'm going to go straight on to um, the question of trends in income inequality. Um, and the, it's really important that, to note that income inequality can be measured in several ways, which, and the several ways actually measure somewhat different things. And so the different methods of measuring income inequality do give different results. And the debate can go round and round in circles, and in particular can become quite polemical, because some people are using one set of measures and other people are using another, um, so that the trends do depend on which measures we choose. Well, I'm going to particularly concentrate tonight on the measure of um, not inequality over the whole of the distribution, which is, for example, offered often measured by the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient is profoundly misleading in several kinds of ways, not least because the Gini coefficient systematically underestimates the magnitude and the changes in inequality. Um, we can come back to that at the end if you wish. I can uh, explain it with a simple example of why the Gini coefficient, which is the most commonly used measure, is actually profoundly conservative. You might even call it a right-wing measure of inequality. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the question of income concentration, income concentration um, at the top, and begin with this remarkable chart from the great book that we're celebrating tonight. Um, this is New Zealand. Uh, it, shows, it runs from about 1984 through to more or less today. Um, this is the average income of households in the middle of the distribution, the income distribution in New Zealand from 1984 through to today. You can see that it's been pretty well uh, flat. Um, this is the income of the top 1%. And roughly speaking, this gap uh, between the middle and the top 1% uh, at the two ends, roughly speaking, has doubled. Now, uh, if there's any statistician, I'm sure there are in the audience, you will immediately quibble. This is uh, pre-tax and this is post-tax. But um, nevertheless, you can get the general picture, even allowing for that. What has happened to income distribution in New Zealand since 1984 and the famous Roger Nomics uh, ex uh, experiment is that income distribution using this measure has sort of opened up like the jaws of a snake. That's the image that you uh, can derive from that uh, rather dramatic diagram the jaws of a snake. Here's another measure. This is the share, the percentage share of the top 1% um, in New Zealand national income from 1921 through more or less till today. 
um, I want to draw your attention to this uh, low point, which was around about 5% reached in the 1980s, and then it went shooting up um, through the 1980s, 90s, uh, it's kind of leveled off, more or less, ignoring this, which was a glitch. Um, around about, it's gone back up to around about 9%. So you can say that it's gone up roughly from, say, 5 to 6%, um, through to, to, uh, to, to about 9%. And that means, of course, that if the percentage increase in the share of the top 1% is, let's say, 4% over that period, that means that everybody else's share has gone down by 4%. And, in fact, much of that shrinkage has been concentrated on people at the bottom. And hence the problem of poverty, exclusion, and so on. Um, so... Um, I've summarized the, the gist of these two slides. I want to move now to the United States because um, relative to the United States, New Zealand remains a relatively equal country relative to the United States. But the United States is by far the most unequal of the developed countries. And by the way, I'm speaking tonight of the developed countries. I'm not including Russia, Brazil, China, and so on, the developed countries. So this is one of the most important charts you need to, to know to understand the history of the 20th century in the world. Um, it, I want to draw your attention to three things. This is the steep increase in the share of the top 1% through the 1920s. That increase of income concentration at the top in the United States through the 1920s was directly related to the Great Crash and the following uh, depression in which the share of the top percent fell and fell and fell through the Second World War, Lyndon Johnson's Good Society and so on. The top 1% was getting squeezed and squeezed relative to this uh, to reach a low of around about 9% by um, the, uh, by the late 1970s. And by this time, the right wing in the United States was getting furious at this unfair compression of their income share and they helped to provide the fuel for the Reagan uh, revolution, um, which by means of a whole variety of measures, some, some of which I'll come back to later, um, uh, raised the share of the top 1% in a quite spectacular fashion. This is roughly like the trajectory of a July the 4th skyrocket heading to the skies to reach uh, by 2006, roughly the same level as in 1920. Nine, and of course it went up some more, um, and we are living through the second Great Depression as a result of this, at least partial result, of this kind, this degree of income, income, income concentration at the top, just as happened in the 1930s. Um, so this is a slightly different measure. It's the share of the top 1% in U.S. income growth, not the total, but the increase in uh, in national income over, in this case, the 1990s, the Clinton period, the top 1% got 45% of the increase. Um, during the 2000s, Bush, 73%. Um, so by that standard, Clinton was positively socialistic. Um, and then, of course, it's increased even more under Obama in 2010, that one year, uh, the top uh, 1% accrued 93% of the increase, leaving just 7% of the increase for everybody else. I don't have the figures for New Zealand, but I do suggest that this would be a very relevant measure uh, to look at for those of you interested in the question. However, the, it's the Anglo countries where this increase have been, has been particularly pronounced. That is the United States, Britain, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, um, Northwest European countries um, and some Central European countries have experienced the increase to a lesser degree. Um, this is, um, shows the three Scandinavian countries, and the point I'll draw your attention to is that this is 1980. It reached the share of the top 1%, fell down to around about 5%, a bit lower than in the United States at this time, and then it sort of more or less flattened out with this exception of Norway. I don't quite know what happened in Norway. This spike looks like the spike that happened in New Zealand. Um, but in, in any case, Norway's come back down to this range of 5 or 
also much lower than um, in the United States and lower also than in Brit uh, New Zealand. Um, this surge in global income concentration is global and here's one indicator. It's the number of high net worth individuals, that is to say people with more than uh, as, uh, one million dollars spare cash, not including houses. Um, and uh, the number increased by more than 9% in just one year, to 2012, um, and their wealth increased by 10% over the previous year. So this is an enormous increase in um, income and wealth concentration at the top. And of course, within this group, the, the super rich, that is people with more than a spare $30 million to throw around, increased uh, even more. Um, so, on the one hand, we have this surge in income inequality in many, but not all, capitalist economies. On the other hand, it's hardly been a political issue, and that is very remarkable, and, uh, including in New Zealand. Um, and the question is why? Um, well, conservatives, social democrats, and very importantly, mainstream economists tend to focus on poverty, on exclusion, on failing families, on gender inequality, and so on, number one. And number two, they focus on equality or inequality of opportunities. And they make a big distinction between, oh yes, we're concerned to make, in, uh, the, uh, make opportunities less unequal, but we'll leave the question of income uh, to the side. Um, and most of these groups accept the mainstream economics argument that income inequality is necessary for a dynamic capitalism um, and in any, uh, necessary to generate the resources with which uh, the poor can later be helped. This, of course, is the classic Rogernomics kind of argument. Um, and so let me anchor this by quoting Tony Blair. He was being interviewed on Newsnight with Jeremy Paxman. Jeremy Paxman asked him whether he thought that the share of income uh, accruing to the very top in the UK uh, was fair or not, and Tony Blair twisted and turned and huffed and puffed and tried to avoid the question, but eventually he blurted out this very inarticulate uh, answer, which was basically the, kind of the trickle-down. We need people at the top being rich so that uh, the economy will generate the resources which will then be used to help people at the bottom. So this is Tony Blair in 2001. This is Obama in 2010. He was being interviewed on the question of whether he thought it was fair that the head of J.P. Morgan had just received a $17 million bonus, that's the bonus, not the total remuneration, and the head of Goldman Sachs had just received a $9 million bonus, and Obama's answer was, I, like most of the American people, don't begrudge people success or wealth, that's just part of the free market system. So those are two politicians being rather um, unconcerned about inequality at the top. Um, here's uh, a mainstream economist, Willem Boiter, my former colleague at the London School of Economics, who said in the Financial Times in 2007, poverty bothers me, inequality does not, I just don't care. And um, I had dinner with him some time after he uh, published this statement, I, and I said, Willem, did you really mean that? And he said, yes, why should I care what David Beckham gets? And that was the end of the matter. Um, uh, and so he would, he would agree that inequality is inevitable and necessary for incentives. And uh, going with the, in the same spirit of just ignoring the issue, the World Bank has said almost nothing about inequality in, over the past 30 years or so as distinct from poverty. It's written a lot about poverty, but very little about inequality because um, it regards inequality as a political matter but, and it says that uh, the World Bank is an apolitical organization, but it regards poverty as somehow not a political uh, matter. So the bank can talk about poverty, but not talk about inequality. It's particularly, by the way, the Chinese and the Russian executive directors who most insist on this point. The bank must not talk about inequality because inequality is political. And we are not a political organization. Well, um, some leaders of center-left parties are actually concerned about inequality, um, but 
they have made a tactical choice, a tactical choice, not to talk about inequality and rather, or to the extent they do, to kind of slide inequality into the domain of poverty and exclusion. Um, and especially they don't want to talk about income concentration at the top. And the question is why? One reason is because they depend, the center-left parties depend, just like conservatives, on big donors, and big donors don't want any political parties to whom they give money to talk about income concentration at the top, not surprisingly. And secondly, because the center-left parties think that the middle-class electorate is, gets pretty jumpy when they hear words about inequality um, uh, and uh, redistribution, because redistribution might mean bringing up people down below them, and that is something that worries them quite a lot. So there's a tactical choice. Let me summarize uh, the points so far. Inequality of income has remained pretty invisible um, in public policy, even as it has surged. Um, the focus has been on poverty, exclusion, um, inequality of opportunities, and to the extent that inequality of incomes is treated as a problem, it is reduced to, well, is David Beckham's salary a problem? I mean, uh, yes, is he paid a salary? Uh, yes, um, is that a problem? Uh, or does, does um, Jamie Dimon deserve his $17 million bonus? And of course, once you frame it in those terms, that simply bypasses the whole issue of the societal or the e economy-wide costs of inequality, and that's what I want to come to now. Um, I want to talk about three kinds of costs, uh, economic, social, and health, and political, especially I'm going to talk about political. But uh, beginning with inequality and economic performance. So the mainstream economic argument says inequality necessary for incentives. So you would expect that more unequal countries amongst the developed countries are more prosperous. What's the evidence? Well, it depends how you measure prosperity. The common measure is GDP per capita. If you use GDP per capita, then the US, which is by far the most unequal of the developed countries, is also, um, has also got the highest per capita taking out Luxembourg. Luxembourg doesn't count. So the US is the um, number one in the OECD. Uh, New Zealand, by the way, by this measure is 21 in the OECD. But this is not a good measure for all that it is the standard measure. The reason is obvious. People are not inputs into production. Uh, inputs into production are labor hours. So you should take GDP per hour worked. And when you take this figure, uh, it turns out that Northwestern Europeans work less hours than Americans. And so the United States sinks to number eight in the OECD after France, Norway, Netherlands, and about equal to Germany. New Zealand, by this measure, does even worse, a little worse, than by the first measure. So um, this kind of evidence runs against the mainstream argument that you need high levels, like US levels of inequality, in order to generate dynamism, in order to generate prosperity for all. Um, here's an interesting um, and unconventional measure of long-run economic performance, and it has to do with heights. Um, average height can be used as a non-income measure of long-run economic performance because height depends on um, household income in youth. And so, again, the mainstream argument would suggest that the more unequal countries would have higher uh, average heights. Uh, what is the evidence? This is the evidence. So this is an index, the Gini coefficient of inequality. These are the unequal countries. Here's the US, uh, here's the UK, here's Australia, here's Canada. Um, these are the unequal ones, these are the more equal ones. And guess what? It's the more equal countries that have the higher heights. These ones, Sweden, Norway, Belgium, Czech, Germany, and so on. Denmark up here. Um, so this is another piece of evidence that runs straight against the mainstream economic view. We need inequality to have incentives to, provide, to generate a dynamic economy. And uh, then out of, those resources, resource, uh, out of the, that wealth, resources can be found for the re redistributing to the poor because we're very concerned about poverty out there. Um, 
a, a third indicator about the relationship between inequality and economic performance has to do with crisis, the kind of crisis that we're living through, the kind of crisis of the 1930s. There's a direct relationship, um, and the relationship is that as inequality, especially concentration at the top, um, increased, then um, incomes lower down remained stagnant or, or fell, but households lower down increased their consumption by borrowing. And the wealthy up at the top lent their savings down to the middle and lower income households. Um, and the government helped to facilitate this credit. And so we got these great housing bubbles and stock market bubbles and so on. The key mechanism of what, we, uh, what produced the situation that we're living through was caught by the Roman playwright Plautus in the third century BC who had one of his characters declare, I love this quote, I am a rich man, comma, as long as I do not repay my creditors. And this was the spirit in which much of the Western world lived over the 2000s. Um, this went, all this went, income concentration at the top and then people lower down borrowing, uh, went with a sort of hyper-financialization. And I'll give two dramatic indicators of this process of hyper-financialization of the economy. Um, one of them is the ratio of financial transactions, that's sales of stocks and bonds and other kinds of financial instruments, relative to world GDP. So this ratio was in 1997 15 times, and by uh, 2012 it had risen to almost 70. This means that an enormous inverted pyramid of financial, the financial economy has grown on top of a much smaller real economy base. In fact, even to the point where this basic distinction that we all use between the financial economy and the real economy, even that distinction is breaking or has broken down because so many of the real economy corporations are actually heavily involved in the financial sector, getting a lot of their revenues from financial dealings. And the second um, indicator is that of the 50 biggest firms in the world by revenues, in about 2010, 49 of them were financial firms. So there's an intimate relationship between income concentration at the top and hyper-financialization of the world economy. I'm going to skip that one. And just um, one, one indicator of this uh, process relates to what is called the excess wage in the financial sector. So the excess wage in the financial sector means the amount or the, the, um, the percentage more than a comparator group of professionals that people in the financial sector are paid. So comparator group of professionals might be doctors, engineers, lawyers, astronomers. You can put a lot of categories into the control group. And then you look at how their average pay compares with that of people in the financial sector in Wall Street, for example. So this is 1920. You see a big increase in the ratio, in, in the multiple of the remuneration in finance compared to this control group through the 1920s, corresponding with that run-up that I showed you earlier it, for the United States in terms of the share of income accruing to the top 1%. And then the crash, and then the share of finance fell way down so that by 1980, there was no prestige attached to working in Wall Street. Wall Street people were not, no better paid, even perhaps less better paid, according to this particular index, than uh, the control group. And then, again, with Reagan, with, uh, with Thatcher, with Roger Nomics, and so on, took off like a July the f 4th skyrocket. And so that's why people are, uh, with PhDs in mathematics and physics and astronomy and the like are <coughs> pulling out of those subjects and going to work in finance. In fact, my prospective uh, son-in-law, um, who is a uh, seven-eighths finished a PhD in statistics at Oxford in the analysis of genetic interactions insofar as they produce these interactions, produce certain diseases like diabetes. He's kind of put all that to the side. He's lost interest in it. He is working for a hedge fund. And I... Um, 
I view this with some bemusement. Um, so I've, I've been talking about the relationship between inequality on the one hand and economic performance on the other. I want to move quite briefly, because I really want to talk about politics, um, to um, health and social costs. And I'm going to refer mainly to this book by Wilkinson and Pickett, The Spirit Level, in 2009. The core argument is that amongst the developed countries, they have a sample of about mm, 21, 23 developed countries, plus 50 U.S. states. Amongst the more unequal of these units, um, sorry, let me repeat that, the more unequal of these units, countries or U.S. states, um, have higher levels of a whole set of um, social and health problems, um, higher levels than more equal countries and more equal U.S. states. And this is a summary of their results. It's very dramatic. The indicator, um, the index includes a whole lot of um, components, and in the book they disaggregate this index and look at the components uh, individually in relation to inequality, but they summarize it with this overall index, which includes things like life expectancy, infant mortality, and so on. Also, down the bottom, very importantly, social mobility. Um, social mobility is strongly inversely correlated with um, inequality, so that high inequality countries like the US and the UK have very low social mobility. Um, but overall, you see this strikingly close correlation. So, for example, Japan has low income inequality and a low score on this index of social problems, whereas the U.S. right up here has a high inequality and a very high score on the index of social problems. New Zealand is here, the U.K. here, Australia here. You see by this, in this particular sample, New Zealand comes number five in terms of the uh, Gini coefficient measure of inequality. So it's up towards the top, but it's by no means the most unequal. Um, and um, this is the correlation between scores on the index and gross national product per head. So you see there's not much of a correlation. Look at the UK and Japan, for example, the same level of per capita income. Australia, more or less the same, but very different measures of, um, on the index of inequality. Notice how much poorer New Zealand is than, say, Australia on this particular measure of G GDP per capita in purchasing power parity terms. So this is, I think, um, uh, this is one way by which Wilkinson and Pickett summarize their results. If you want the American dream, go to live in Denmark. Now, there is a whole industry of people critiquing the Wilkinson and Pickett book, and we could spend time talking about uh, the various qualifications you have to make. But I agree with Tim Hazeldean, professor of economics in Auckland, who reviewed the book, and he said that the, the cumulative effect of the evidence is really quite compelling. There is, there is certainly something there. There's no question that high levels of inequality do, in a society do have quite strong economic and health Costs. If you want to talk more about the qualifications, um, we can do so at the end. So I want to talk now about inequality and political costs because this has received much less attention than the other two thing, costs I've been talking about, but it's really important. Um, and the basic point is this, that is, as income concentration at the top increases, then political and business elites tend to transform themselves from what I call establishment elites, that is elites that see themselves as presiding over the health, let us say, the contentment of the whole society, into oligarchic or plutocratic elites. And so you find that in countries with an oligarchic elite, the uh, economic policy is made, and this is the sort of summary statement, made by the top 1% for the top 1%. And the question is, how does this apply, if at all, to New Zealand? Well, on Sunday morning, I had a Q&A interview 
and uh, I was referring to high inequality developed countries in general, not only to New Zealand, I think I mentioned New Zealand in that capacity, but um, Bill English, uh, sitting outside in the ante room, uh, erupted like a volcano when I made that statement uh, about um, in high inequality countries such as the, I think I said the US, the UK, New Zealand, um, economic policy is made by the top 1% for the top 1%. He erupted and said that's absolute nonsense. And when um, I was coming out of the studio and he was coming in, he came up to me and said in the most menacing way, uh, it is not true that economic policy in New Zealand is made by the top 1% for the top 1%. Don't you say that again. <laughs> well, to be honest, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> I, I, I thought he was the studio technician, <clears throat> and, and I was very surprised. Um, however, I did recover myself, and uh, when I realized he was actually going to sit down and, and be interviewed, I realized who it was, um, and I said, well, thank you, Minister, for your kind advice. Um, but let's put the polemics um, aside, I, I was very surprised at his manner. Um, the there is a question of evidence, and the, the question is, in New Zealand, is there a sharp difference in preferences about economic policy between the top 1% and the rest of the population, um, as there is in the UK and the US? And secondly, if there is this difference in preferences as to what government policy should be, whose preferences get actually translated into government policy. In the case of the US, there is no doubt. It is very dramatic, and I refer to research by Martin Gillens, um, who, which shows that US national politicians respond mainly to the wealthiest voters. And that's interesting because political scientists say that politicians respond to the median voters because that's how they get elected. Gillen's and also other people's, Thomas Ferguson's work, shows that they respond mainly to the preferences of the wealthiest voters. And so um, two statements summarizing Gillen's conclusions. Um, influence over actual policy outcomes appears to be reserved almost exclusively for those at the top of the income distribution. Uh, second statement, the middle class did not fare much better than the poor. Uh, when their opinions departed from those of the well-off. So that's pretty clear evidence for the United States. And just to pin this down a bit more specifically, polling evidence in the U.S. shows that a large majority of people whom the pollsters call wealthy, they agree. And when I say large majority, I mean sort of 80% of the wealthy agree. Number one, the top priority today is for the government to cut the budget deficit and not to raise employment. Number two, they say the deficit must be cut not by raising taxes, but by cutting public spending on welfare. And number three, they say the minimum wage must not be linked to the cost of living. Now, the pollsters also find that the public at large, the other 99%, so to speak, um, has the opposite preferences on all those three points. Well guess whose preferences get translated into U.S. government policy. Um, so that, that all raises the question, why do elites in high inequality developed countries tend to behave like oligarchies? That is to say, making laws and policies in their own interest to boost their own income and wealth and, uh, and political influence, uh, income and wealth position and their political position. And I think you, it's useful to refer to a whole body of psychological research which concludes from many different kinds of uh, uh, evidence that there is what is called a money-empathy gap. That is to say, those living in more, in more unequal societies, those living high up on the socioeconomic ladder, like the U.S. Uh, top 1% or 2%, um, tend to be more selfish, less empathetic, and less moral. They tend to see others as aids or obstacles to their own ambition. I'm not making this up. This is research. For example, you can find some references to this research if you Google Paul Piff at Berkeley, um, who summarized in a recent interview 
um, much of this research by saying the rich are way more likely to prioritize their own self-interests above the interests of other people. What's going on is that the rich in the more unequal societies, so I'm not talking Denmark, at least not anything like the same degree, um, the rich develop social stereotypes or prejudices about the poor, which blame the poor for their poverty and unemployment, and therefore the rich say, well, why should I, a successful person, use my resources to help the poor, given that they've chosen, so to speak, their fate? And conservative political ideology just tends to justify these prejudices. To understand the um, fallacies of, uh, of this way of thinking, the money empathy gap, the effects that people subject to this money empathy gap have, I think it's useful to tell the story of what happens when a hundred dogs are ushered into a room in which are hidden 95 bones. So, you know from the beginning that five dogs are going to come out without a bone. Um, however, that's not the point that the conservatives focus upon. The compassionate conservatives, such as Bill English, um, say that clearly these five dogs that have come out without a bone need to be sent to, um, dog, um, to bone hunting school. Um, they need to polish their CVs, they need to get on their bike, and so on. Um, uh, but the normal conservatives, actually that's what the normal conservatives say, get on your bike, uh, they say that the five dogs came out without a bone because they're lazy. They didn't try hard enough. And so therefore the solution is to cut their income support and force them to hunt um, harder. This is Norman Tebbett, uh, get on your bike in order to find work at a, at a time of very high unemployment. This is the money empathy gap um, in, in action, so to speak. Um, and just to show I'm not making this all up, here is um, a recent statement from the chair of the House Budget Committee in the United States, one of the most powerful politicians in the United States, who has, he goes on and on about how uh, U.S. national character is being sapped by social programs. And he said recently that social programs turn the safety net into a hammock. I love that. A hammock that lulls able-bodied people to lives of dependency and complacency. So you can see the relationship between uh, being high on the socioeconomic ladder and the development of social prejudices. Um, this is uh, a similar kind of sentiment expressed from Prime Minister Norman Key, uh, reported in the National Business Review in 2011. Um, the article said Prime Minister Key today stood by his comment that some people needed to use food banks because they had made poor choices. And the article quotes uh, Key as saying, anyone on a benefit actually has a lifestyle choice. Um, if one budgets properly, one can pay one's bills. So the people going to food banks, in other words, have made a, a lifestyle choice. And it's really not the business of the successful people in the society, like John Key, to be supporting them. That just takes away, this erodes the moral fiber of the society. Um, so the question then is, why are the rich so influential in economic policy? And the short answer is because political parties and political candidates have become so dependent on a wealthy minority, that is the people occupying the roles in the economy of investors, speculators, lenders, hirers and firers, this wealthy minority for donations, donations and loans, loans very important. And so that the, uh, the money empathy gap in the minds of the wealthy uh, get translated into um, policy. And I do recommend two remarkable chapters in Nikki Hager's book, The Hollow Men, chapters 14 and 15, um, which spell out the way in which big money shaped the policies of the National Party over the 2000s. In particular, and I love this detail, um, the big money people were very upset at the centrist policies pursued by Bill English, who my friend from the television studio, 
Um, and so they booted him out and they put in Don Brash because Don Brash had promised the big money people that he would follow the policies uh, that they wanted. So um, again, I'm not making this stuff up. This is in Nikki Hague's book, The Hollow Men. Let me summarize um, the point I'm making about the relationship between inequality and democracy or in inequality and political costs. The costs are in terms of the basic viability of a democratic system um, I, because I think a whole lot of evidence suggests that high inequality capitalism is now working at cross purposes with democracy. That is to say, it's weakening substantive democracy, though of course still within a framework of formal democracy, you know, elections and a parliament and so on. But these institutions of formal democracy are increasingly not functioning uh, in a substantively democratic way because of the link between high income inequality on the one hand and the preferences of the wealthy which are preferences mediated by this money empathy gap. And just to pin this down, this is the world's 10th richest man um, who runs a luxury good uh, corporation or so I'm told, I've not had the pleasure of his products but he said in 2000, um, businesses, especially international ones, have ever greater resources and in Europe they've acquired the ability to compete with states, to compete with states. Politicians' real impact on the economic life of a country is more and more limited. Stop. Fortunately, he said, uh, I have to confess I put in the emphasis on fortunately, but I, I think I was astonished when I read this. It is a remarkably... Um, transparent um, example of, let's say, the, the money empathy gap. So just to summarize my overall points about the relationship between inequality and all these various costs I've been talking about, I swim, and I like this metaphor, you have a swimming pool with a urinating section and a non-urinating section. But the problem is that for all those people in the non-urinating section, they can't remain uh, isolated from the consequences of the behavior of people in the urinating section. Um, as, in other words, inequality has pervasive societal-wide, economy-wide costs such that even the wealthy can't uh, escape unless they have private jets and helicopters and own islands in the Pacific where they go for, for their holidays. Um, so now the final point of the talk. What might constitute, how might one think about a progressive agenda? Um, well, the starting point is, is this. This is the point to keep coming back to, um, that making capitalism work for everybody and not just for the plutocrats is one of our most pressing problems. And that's the point that has been systematically ignored. So. The next point, accept that some inequality is inevitable and some inequality is necessary. For example, you can take Scandinavian levels of inequality as a kind of a benchmark. Thirdly, challenge the idea that inequality of incomes at, for example, US, UK, and maybe you want to put in New Zealand, levels um, is necessary, necessary for dynamic economic performance. It's clearly not despite what main, mainstream, much mainstream economic thinking says. Um, fourthly, insist that the question of poverty, exclusion, cannot be dealt with just sort of uh, on its own, as though th there are people over here who we must help. Um, the problems of inequality um, at the bottom are intimately related with concentration at the top. And partly, it's just blindingly obvious for arithmetic reasons, if income share at the top is going up, then the share of everybody lower down must be shrinking. And that will um, generate pressures, uh, particularly intensively, down at the bottom, uh, uh, at least unless the state makes a real big effort to protect people down at the bo bottom. But that's, that's a big if. Um, I want to say a bit more now about this point, more attention to pre-distribution. My point is this, that um, social democrats, people on the center-left, have accepted um, much too readily the conservative framing of the idea that you have 
markets over here generating an income distribution. Um, and, and then um, uh, you have the state over here, which is taxing market incomes and redistributing some of the taxes uh, downwards, or in practice, quite a lot of it is redistributed upwards. But, um, in, if, and, and then the uh, center left all, all concentrates on the public sector, that is, on the questions of what kind of taxes should be used, uh, what kind of uh, transfer mechanisms should be used, and so on and so on. And the, the third way, for example, was obsessed with this question of how to design taxes, how to design redistribution. But the assumption of this on the part of the center-left, they buy into the, the conservatives of assumption that the private sector over here that's generating the market incomes is sort of like a caged lion. It's just waiting to escape suffocating reg state regulations uh, the state just gets out of the private sector, the private sector will generate the dynamism and then the state can tax and redistribute. No, um, center-left people should be focusing uh, much more, relatively speaking, uh, on pre-distribution, that is on the forces that are causing a concentration of market incomes before take-home incomes, market incomes, up to the top. The question then being how to make market incomes more equal, particularly for this reason, namely that most of the disparity in take-home income distribution is caused by the disparity in market income distribution. So if you're not dealing with market income distribution, you're dealing with the smaller part of the problem. And the, the, the key point is this, that many uh, government laws, regulations, and policies have the effect of sluicing income up towards the top. Um, the American economist Dean Baker says we have a conservative nanny state. Um, conservatives like to talk about the nanny state as in the welfare state, which is helping uh, people lying in hammocks and getting welfare checks. That's the nanny state from the point of view of conservatives. Well, he talks of the conservative nanny state that is using a whole range of pre-distribution methods to channel income up to towards the top. And just let me give an example. This is a really dramatic example, even though the television interviewer at Q&A, Susan Woods, I think, uh, tried to cut me off from uh, explaining this example, saying that New Zealand didn't have quantitative easing and therefore it was not relevant. Well, that's not the point. Um, the point is that quantitative easing has been a technique of monetary stimulation used in the UK, used in the US, used in many other countries, even if not New Zealand. And it's presented as a sort of economy-wide and neutral way of stimulating the economy, the whole economy. So implicitly, everybody benefits. Um, but a remarkable study was made by the Bank of England, published in August 2012, which showed, and this is a sort of paraphrase of the Bank of England's own con uh, conclusion, that quantitative easing is a mechanism of crisis mitigation which strongly advances the interests of the wealthy. And the reason is because um, quantitative easing has had the effect not so much of stimulating spending through the economy because most households are trying to pay down debt, not increase their borrowing, but rather stimulating stock market bubbles and housing bubbles. And guess who owns most of the stock? Guess who owns the most expensive houses? The people who benefit from the run-up of stocks and house prices are the wealthy, people already up at the top. Um, so that study, I think, by the Bank of England, August 2012, is quite a dramatic one. Okay, so there are many other kinds of policies um, that center-left people, progressives, should be looking at for their income distribution effects. One would be, for example, corporate governance law. If you have, and somebody told me that this is not true in New Zealand, I don't know, but if you have a corporate governance law which says, one, senior exec get executives of corporations decide uh, on the, or appoint the board of directors to the corporation, Two, the boards of directors decide the salaries of senior management. Guess what happens? 
uh, with a scratch my back, I'll scratch your back kind of ethics. The salaries spiral up. So if you want to do something about pre-distribution income, look at corporate governance law and see what kind of income distribution effects it's having. Similarly, trade union law. Everybody knows, at least every American knows, that when Ronald Reagan came in, he cut taxes on the wealthy. But um, the effect of his cutting taxes on the wealthy in concentrating income up at, the, up at the top was actually quite small compared to other things that he did. And one of the most important other things of a pre-distribution kind he did was to greatly limit the rights of trade unions to organize and to bargain collectively, tipping the balance of power in the whole society in favor of um, executives um, and investors, shareholders, big shareholders. Um, and that, in turn, helped to concentrate income up at the top. Um, intellectual property law. Patents give way too much protection to patent holders uh, relative to what is necessary to induce, to provide incentives for innovation. So this is a way by which the state gives a monopoly of rental income, so to speak, on uh, the holders of patents. Um, exchange rate policy. If a government, the US government, for example, runs a high dollar policy uh, on the exchange rate, that benefits the financial sector and it handicaps the manufacturing sector. And that has strong income distribution effects as well. My point is that there are many uh, policies, laws, regulations, which have income concentrating effects. And people on the center left should be looking across the board before looking at the public sector and taxes and redistribution and so on. They should be looking to lower the inequality of market incomes by changing some of the, uh, these other policies. Just very quickly, my second to last point. Um, in terms of dealing with income inequality over the whole range, there's this, there's, there's this point that even people on the left, but especially conservatives, for decades have been talking down the state, talking about the inefficiencies of the state and framing the whole thing as a kind of trade-off. Either we have more market and less state, or we have more state and less market. And if those are the choices, we clearly want more market and less state. Um, and so people on the center-left should be pushing the idea of the potential for the state acting as a kind of entrepreneurial state to complement the entrepreneurial activities in the private sector. For example, not just basic research and development, but research and development which goes beyond the basic stage, um, giving a kind of directional thrust. An entrepreneurial state would surely not have uh, simply allowed the hillside workshop in Dunedin to simply disappear. It would have really paid attention to the possibilities of diversifying out of railways into adjacent kind of activities. But um, in the conservative framing of the appropriate role of the state, well, if the resources in, in the hillside uh, workshop can't be competitive internationally, let the thing collapse and let the resources disperse to uh, places where they will be used more competitively. That's a complete nonsense. And I say this with some passion because I've done a lot of research on East Asian um, development, including East Asian um, industry policy. And uh, the role of the state was much more active there than what you've seen in New Zealand. If you want to follow this up, I recommend the book by Mariana Matsukato, The Entrepreneurial State, published just this year. Finally, we can talk about all these things, what should be done till the cows come home, but basically nothing much is going to happen except in terms of poverty. Nothing much is going to happen in terms of overall inequality until we find ways to limit the role of big money in party financing. Um, the point being that as long as parties and candidates depend heavily on big donors uh, for finance, then big donors get their preferences translated into government policies in the, in the way that Nikki Hager pointed out in The Hollow Men. Um, and it's not just a matter of big donors getting their policies uh, translated, getting their preferences translated into policy. It's also they may want to have policies designed 
with loopholes included so they can ev evade them. And that's the point of this cartoon in the New Yorker 2009. So two executives looking at regulations and one says to the other, these new regulations will fundamentally change the way we get around them. Um, and that, of course, was prescient. This was published in 2009. That is what has been happening. For example, um, the Dodd-Frank financial reform bill, the main U.S. financial reform law. The Sunlight Foundation has done a recent study which finds that Wall Street lobbyists met 1,300 times with government officials to influence the Dodd-Frank uh, law, whereas public interest groups met only 242 times. That has met one-fifth, one-fifth the number of times of the Wall Street lobbyists. And so the result is predictable. The uh, Dodd-Frank law, as it is being put into detail, is being eviscerated. And one of the dramatic examples of this evisceration, um, it was snuck out by the U.S. Treasury on, I think, the day before Thanksgiving when nobody was paying attention. Um, they announced that um, foreign exchange swaps and forwards are to be exempt from the Dodd-Frank regulations. And this is dynamite for anybody who knows the mechanism of the East Asian crisis in the late 90s. Um, these foreign exchange swaps and forwards were at, at the center of that mechanism of capital flow. But also more recently, a lot of the capital made available by quantitative easing in the United States, Britain, and elsewhere has simply flowed out of those countries through these kind of instruments into Brazil, into China, into India, causing, for example, great problems in Brazil uh, with the appreciation of the exchange rate and the stock market in a way that the Brazilian government simply cannot control because all this capital is flowing in partly through these instruments. And this is just astonishing that Wall Street, well, it's not astonishing, that Wall Street has been able to uh, get these, this, these particular instruments, which are so profitable for Wall Street, excluded from the Dodd-Frank law. Well, the UK... Uh, Com Committee on Standards and Public Life, an august body, published a report in November 2011 called Political Party Financing, Ending the Big Donor Culture. And it identified several routes. They're familiar enough. And I won't spell them out. You can read them. But the key point is that although this report, which was uh, worked on for a long time with all kinds of experts involved, um, it was a very good, sound report, but it died instantly on the day of publication. Nothing more has happened. And one reason is because even the Labour Party won't run with these ideas because it depends on trade unions and other big money donors for its f campaign finance, just like the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats. So this is the end. Um, with, a, with a dire warning, if Western countries don't reduce income concentration, then we will continue to transit from what I call democratic market capitalism towards oligarchic impunity capitalism. Impunity meaning that a set of people have got themselves into a market position where they privatize the gains and they socialize the losses, or um, socialism for the poor and, um, sorry, um, capitalism for the poor and socialism for the rich. Um, that's number one. And these societies which, uh, where concentration is going up and up, or, or certainly not going down, will continue to experience these high costs, of economic costs, social and health costs, political costs of income concentration at the top. So I think that surging income concentration um, is almost as serious a threat to the future of democratic market capitalism as is climate change and aging um, populations. Um, however, if, uh, in order to end on a note of hope, um, I wish to again draw your attention to this book uh, whose launch is the occasion for this lecture. Thank you. <laughs>